that should work now. Yeah. Um, okay, so, so if, if we use the uh, similarity form, then uh, it allows us also to uh, get analytic, um, uh, uh, an analytic solution. Uh, this, this is shown here in this example. I won't go uh, through the details, but at the end of the day, um, we, you can get an, an expression here for the mixture fraction as function of the similarity variable in, in the, let's say, the counter flow diffusion flame. And that allows you to express the dissipation rate. So I can, I can the dissipation rate is nothing else than dz d eta squared, then, which allows then to get an expression here for the dissipation rate. And it turns out it's this little complex function here. This is the complementary error function of z, uh, and then the exponential of that <laughs> times the strain rate. And so uh, you see this kind of looks like this. And what this means then is that um, that's what I said earlier. For example, uh, for the example of the counter flow diffusion flame, the uh, strain rate and um, dissipation rate are directly related. So the higher the strain rate, the higher the dissipation rate. This functional form then we can also use uh, to solve the Flamel equations. We said earlier the, the Flamel equations have this uh, parameter um, uh, dissipation rate, chi, and this parameter needs to be specified. Earlier in the equation we said it, we specify the stoichiometric value which maybe would be this value here, stoichiometric, about 0.05. But we can also use this as a function of mixer fraction uh, to determine this value. Now, now, if we look at the flame structure, there is a um, very, very famous um, uh, paper by uh, Professor Amable Linian. He was the first one to uh, derive the asymptotic solution for uh, diffusion flames, and he did this on the basis of one-step global chemistry. And, and the solutions uh, you get from this, they're shown here. So this is the temperature, and this here is the fuel mass fraction as function of mixer fraction. This is stoichiometric, and you see that this shows that if the, if the dissipation rate is high, then the temperature is smaller. At the same time, you see here then that the fuel penetrates into the air region or in the oxidizer region. Um, that's that's um, a leak, which is, we call this a leakage of fuel because for fast chemistry, the fuel is all consumed here in the reaction zone. For slower chemistry, then um, it diffuses into the, it, it, the time scale, uh, the, the, the chemical time scale is too long and it cannot be uh, converted uh, to products. Uh, which is why it diffuses here into the, uh, into the um, uh, oxygen. This is not seen in experiments. In experiments, you rather see that the oxygen goes to the other side. Uh, this here is simulation using, using detailed chemistry, and you see here the fuel mass fraction, the temperature, uh, for two different uh, dissipation rates, a low and a high dissipation rate, and you see that the fuel mass fraction profile here in green, it doesn't actually change very much when you get close to ex extinction, but the oxygen here, you see that leaks now into the fuel stream, okay? So that uh, is exactly the opposite of what one-step global chemistry would tell you. Okay, so um, if we look then at the asymptotic structure that was here uh, for, for um, methane flames, was here derived by Seshadri, then um, the outer structure, here, there's a reaction zone again, and there's an outer structure. The outer structure is governed by the Burke Schumann solution. And then the, the inner layer here uh, solution gives a departure from that. Uh, what's interesting then is if we look at the two different solutions, it turns out that the rich side here, that is um, uh, very similar to, or it corresponds, you could say, to it corresponds to, you want me to just go on? Yeah. yeah. Uh, it corresponds to the preheat region in the, um, uh, in the premixed flame. The inner layer uh, is the same. That, co that corresponds to the, the inner layer also in the uh, preheat region. And the, what, what's the oxidation layer 
in the, uh, pre, in the premixed uh, flame is, the, is this lean region here for the non-premixed flame. And you see actually that um, typically the profiles, they are a little curved here in the uh, lean region, the temperature profile, which means again, this curvature means there's heat release here, and that is actually here from the oxidation of CO2. CO2. Um, so we see this here then in the, um, again, in results from simulation. Uh, this is the temperature in red, and then in green is the production rate of CO, and in blue, the production rate of CO2. And so here we have the preheating, and then at some point here when we get close to the reaction zone, the fuel is converted to CO, production of CO becomes very large. And then if we go into uh, in the oxidation, in the lean region, you see there the CO is converted to CO2. CO2 production is positive, CO production is negative, okay? So that kind of shows the correspondence of these uh, different, um, of, of the two different flames. Uh, in, in a sense, they do have some commonality. Especially here also, we said at high dissipation rate, if we're close to extinction, then actually the structure of a non premix flame is very similar to that of a premix flame because now we even have the oxygen leakage, so we have a, a, a kind of a premixed uh, fuel-air system here, then the, then the uh, reaction zone, and then, or the inner layer, and then the oxidation region. So that's, that's, that's very similar then. Okay, so I think, I think that's it. The, the next section here is on single droplet combustion. That would be multi-phase combustion. That's all in a green here because we don't have enough time to cover all these things. So I think uh, that is, that's all I want to say about uh, diffusion flames. Uh, we'll talk more about diffusion flames when we talk about uh, turbulent combustion. Okay? So then... Um, the next thing here is um, uh, now I can find it. The next thing here is on this flame master code. We talked about uh, premixed and non-premixed flames, and um, we didn't talk about auto ignition, well stirred reactor, uh, shock tubes, and so on. And uh, some of you might have talked about this. Uh, in Professor Pilling's class. Um, this Flame Master code is uh, similar to other codes that you, that you can find. It's a code that can do simulations for all. Oh, this is a new lecture, thank you, yeah. Uh, that, that you can do for all these things. The code is available here. You can just look for um, our website in Aachen and you can uh, request the download. The code was written to do all sorts of premix and non premix steady and unsteady configurations, uh, you know, 0D and 1D that, that, you, that are of interest in, in uh, combustion um, uh, uh, scenarios. And uh, the emphasis here really is on pre and post processing, sensitivity analysis, reaction path analysis, and, and so on. And, and I'll show you a few examples for this. So uh, examples are here. This is a shock tube, homogeneous reactor, experiments, and then these are uh, some the lines here are simulations. And so this is octanol. Uh, here we have um, OH mass fraction. These here actually come from, I think these come from uh, the group of uh, the measurements from Professor Hansen, and, and some of you are taking his course. Um, and, and you see how we can compare from the simulations we compare this. Simulation like, like this takes um, uh, less than a second. I mean, it's really, really fast. Uh, to do this, I'll show you uh, in a few minutes, maybe just as one example for how to compute uh, these. Um, this is a flow reactor. Flow reactor like the, the Princeton flow reactor is, is very well known, um, where you have a premixed mixture in a flow reactor, and then you measure concentrations of, as function of the flow uh, distance. And um, uh, the, so, so here you see this method cyclohexane, uh, you know, being, uh, being uh, burnt uh, in this flow reactor. J uh, jet stirred reactor is something, is also a homogeneous system where you uh, typically do experiments at different uh, temperatures. So each point here is a different experiment. 
and, and this shows how, you know, a comparison here for endo decane. These are just some examples. Um, I mentioned um, a reaction flux analysis is actually quite uh, easy with this code. So this just shows a, a flux di reaction flux diagram here for this component methyl cyclohexane. Uh, this shows laminar burning velocities computed for, uh, doesn't even say here what the fuel is and I don't, I don't remember, but it's compared here with different uh, experiments. Um, and these are pre-mixed burner stabilized flames for methyl cyclohexane again. Um, this here is uh, the f uh, fuel profile and uh, this is O2 profile and you know again the, the symbols are the experiments. These are, um, we, you can use the code to compute so-called flamenet libraries. What, what this is, we'll, we'll see later basically what it means is you solve the uh, flamenet equations for different values of dissipation rate. Uh, and then you can store these, tabulate these, and then in, an, in a CFD simulation, you can use these tables. So the code is uh, made to do that also. So you see here different um, simulations for different dissipation rates and uh, uh, as an example. So there is a tutorial here, and I don't think we have the time to go through all the, you know, the, the different examples. Um, and also the different flags uh, and so on. But you can actually follow these slides and try out a few things at home if you're interested in. Uh, this, the code comes with a lot of different uh, examples. Here for homogeneous reactor, premix flame, diffusion flame, uh, flamelet um, uh, solutions and so on. And maybe I'll just say a few words here about uh, code structure and uh, pre-processing and how the input, input files look like. So, uh, as I said, you can download this from the website. Um, uh, the the uh, login is shown here. Um, uh, it, it's, it's best used on a, on a Unix type system. So I use this here on my laptop. The Apple uh, uh, Mac OS has, is based on Unix. So it's very easy to, to use that. Um, it's based on CMake, which means it's just a few commands to uh, install this on your system. CMake is a tool that, that kind of, it looks at what compilers you have and all this uh, on your machine. And then it, uh, you know, just uh, creates all the make files. So you don't need to understand much about the process. You just follow these instructions. And then um, uh, the, um, uh, this is something here. So, so these are just, this is just a sequence of commands. Uh, that, that you could run. Th this here is just an automatic way of doing the pre-processing for all mechanisms that, that are distributed uh, with the code. Um, okay, so installational windows. Uh, there are different options and, and it says here um, option and two are recommended. I don't know anything about windows. I never touched a windows machine in my life. So, um, the, you know, somebody else wrote this if you're interested in this. Uh, try it if it doesn't work. Um, maybe send us um, uh, a note. Uh, maybe we can fix it, but um, uh, maybe not. I mean, uh, it's too, Windows is too complicated. Um, so if everything is installed, you have these directories, repository, build, bin, run, and data. Repository is where all the, 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 the files are. That's where you would make changes if you want to change the code. Uh, build is where, the, where the, um, the compiler operations are being done when you, when you make, uh, when you make the, uh, the executable. And um, that, these are temporary directories which are uh, overwritten if you uh, create a new version, if you download a new version of the code, for example, or if you just, um, if you just compile the code. So, so the repository, this is where changes should be made. Build is temporary. Bin is where then the executables are, um, are uh, found. Uh, run is where the, uh, that has, this has the examples. This is where the code is executed. Uh, typically, you can execute it anywhere, but this is, in, this is a directory that has examples. And data is where the, the, the files that come from the pre-processing, they are all put there. So the code looks in this directory to find these files. Okay, so um, there, there are four different main executables here. One is create bin file, 
ScanMan, FlameMan, and List Tool. This here is for um, the first pre-processing step. This is for a second pre-processing step. Uh, this is the actual code that does all the simulations, and this is a post-processing tool, okay? So the, the files that you need to run this, uh, you need to have a chemical mechanism. A chemical mechanism typically comes uh, with a reaction file. It's called here mechanism file. Uh, it comes with a thermodata file and transport data, okay? So these are typically three different files that if you look somewhere online, you find these in or on the supporting material of a paper. Usually people provide this in Chemkin format. Um, and then, so these are the input files, and another important input file is this uh, Flame Master input file. That is the file where all the controls um, uh, are set. You know, where you set what, say what the pressure is you want to compute, the temperature, and, and things like this. So the idea then is to take this uh, thermal data file and a transport data file. Both of these are text files, and every time you, you want to uh, pre-process the mechanism, you need to read these text files. It takes a long time on a computer to read a text file, so we just convert these into binary files in the beginning because they usually don't change very much. So this is what this does, create bin file, just takes these two as input and creates a binary file which now has all the transport uh, data and the, um, uh, and the thermal data. Then this file and the mechanism input file, they are used by this um, scanman a preprocessor. It just reads all the reactions, it reads all the thermal data, uh, it looks at if reactions are consistent, uh, is the stoichiometry right, uh, you know, have a typo in one of the reactions. Uh, it reports you if you have a reaction more than once, maybe sometimes that's, that's deliberate, sometimes not, um, and so on. It does all these things and then it uh, creates all the uh, it creates all the data that's used in the simulation and writes another um, uh, binary file that is then used by the main code to do all the calculations. So this here creates a file that's called uh, here pre. Pre file is a binary file that has now all the information about the mechanism, thermal data, everything you need uh, about the, the chemistry. And then the, so the main code then takes that as input. It also takes an a uh, controls file, I mentioned this, called Flame Master Input or something. And uh, sometimes it takes additional files, like a start solution that you might use to get a, a faster convergence and so on. And then the output files here are basically the solution, which then uh, can be used here with different tools. Um, here, for example, this uh, list tool code to do post-processing. So, um, create, I mean, these are the thermal data files. Uh, this is how these are converted uh, to, the, um, uh, to the binary file. Uh, we don't need to go through the, the um, details of this. And then the scanman code, uh, it, as I said, it takes this as input. It takes the reaction file. This is the reaction file here in, in Flame Master format. We use an, our own format. Uh, which, which has some advantages to the typical uh, Chemkin 2 format. Um, uh, so uh, uh, it takes this and, and the binary file and from this uh, makes this um, uh, binary output file. And this here just shows the syntax, how this is being used. All codes have a minus help function, so it, it tells you what, what the um, uh, command line options are. But, but here's an example. Camera minus input file is the mechanism file, minus uh, thermal data file is this binary file, minus this means, um, you know, just write all the reactions to standard output, all the species to standard output, all the third bodies to standard output. These are just a few additional flags. Um, because we have our own format and very often people just provide Kempkin uh, two uh, input files, uh, you can also read Kempkin two input files directly. If, if you do that, then you don't need to worry about all the pre-processing. You can just use uh, Kempkin here with a Kempkin uh, input file, uh, mechanism file, and the, um, uh, the, binary f the binary file that I, that I just mentioned. And then here with this option minus F format Kempkin, then uh, this, this will directly take the Kempkin to input file, okay? We used to have a, a little code. Somebody wrote a code to convert Kempkin files to 
uh, this Flame Master format, but, but uh, it's always a little difficult to do that, so this is an easier option. So that's then how the input file looks for Flame Master, and the, one of the most important, um, so Flame Master, uh, if you don't specify, you can just execute this command Flame Master or Flame Man, Flame Master, whatever, and um, you know, it, it look, you don't need to specify an input file, it looks for a file flamemaster.input, okay? So, but if you don't have that, or if you want to call it differently, then you can also specify uh, an input file on the command line with a minus i option, okay? So the, the, the flamemaster input file then, the most important thing, I think this, this just shows a few things here, the most important thing it has, uh, which is not here on the first slide, maybe I'll show you here, is the configuration. This says flame is um, isochorous homogeneous reactor, constant volume homogeneous reactor. This would be a constant pressure homogeneous reactor. This could be flame is unstretched premix flame, uh, counterflow diffusion flame, whatever. I mean, this is where you would say, uh, this is the configuration I want to compute. And then um, the other things here, uh, like, for example, output path, you know, this where the output, you will find the output. How many outputs as function of time uh, should be written. This is the, the name of the mechanism file, the, this pre-file that was made with Kemkin, uh, with a, with a uh, Scanman. Uh, usually, we specify the global reaction and what is the fuel, what's the oxidizer. Why is this important? Uh, this is important to compute the equivalence ratio, okay? So then here, you can just say, Equivalence ratio phi is equal to one, and then with the uh, with um, global reaction, the specification of fuel and oxygen, uh, this will give you the composition in the beginning. Um, then this is the pressure, and for the homogeneous reactor here, as an example, you can specify more than one equivalence ratio and more than one pressure, and it will just compute all of these at this, uh, uh, one after the other. Okay, so if you specify. So, um, typically what we want for ignition delay times, we want to get this, um, I'll show you here, uh, we want to get a curve like this, okay, for different temperatures. And typically, what you want, so you want to get all these solutions. So this is ignition delay time uh, at this temperature, and this here is at this temperature, so these are many individual simulations. This here is at 13 bar, and this is um, equivalence ratio one, equivalence ratio two. So these are many different simulations, okay? So you need to specify this in the input file that you want to do all these at the same time. So you can say in the input file here, you can say uh, T, temperature, so initial conditions, temperature is equal to uh, 1,000 Kelvin. And then it will just give you 1,000 Kelvin. But here's a little trick I invented when I was a grad student. If I specify a temperature, that is less than 10 Kelvin, then it assumes this is the inverse of temperature, uh, 1,000 divided by temperature. Because for these, for these um, uh, ignition delay times, we always want to plot it as a function of 1,000 over temperature, okay? So then uh, 1.7 here means, okay, this is, this is obviously 1.7 Kelvin is not a reasonable temperature here. So this is one over the temperature, so this is 588, uh, 1,000 over the temperature, so it's 588 Kelvin. And then uh, there's a continuation here. The type is temperature. So, so the, this tells the code, I want to do not just one simulation, I want to do a continuation, do one and then continue to the next one. And the, the continuation parameter is the temperature, the initial temperature. The, the increment from one solution to the next is 0.1. So this will do 1.7, 1.6, 1.5, and so on. And the, uh, the, the bound is then 0.7. So it will do this all the way to 0.7, okay? So this will compute um, ignition delay times for all temperatures from uh, 1.7, which is 588, to 0.7, which, which is 1400 Kelvin or 1500 Kelvin, roughly. Okay, and then you get, you get an equidistant uh, distribution of these ignition delay times, which gives you a nice curve. And then, uh, so this will do all temperatures. Here I specify two different pressures. So it will first do the first pressure, all temperatures, and then the second one. And if I would also specify different equivalence ratios, it does that all at the same time, okay? So we can, maybe we can see uh, just one example, you know, how this works. So here, this is my, this is my 
Oh, I lost my window. I actually, so I go to this directory. Oh, sorry. Master. Uh, let's see if I can directly copy this from here. So I do go to this example here. So I go to okay run. Uh, flame man, there would also be a scan man uh, directory. And then there's a, a premixed and non premixed. And there's zero D and different one dimension configurations. And there are different fuels, and this is heptane. Okay? So this should give me then, um, you see, this has this uh, file, flame master.input, which is what we just discussed. Okay? And now I can just execute. Uh, the code, and then you see, you know, it just goes wild, and now it computed all these different temperatures and, and, and the two different pressures. So you see how fast this is. This was one second for, uh, you know, uh, all these different ignition delay times. Here's the last one as an example. This one was for 13 bar, equivalence ratio of 2. Uh, temperature of 1400 Kelvin, so this is the 0 0.7, is 1 divided, or 1000 divided by 0 0.7. And then uh, this says here, start execution. And then uh, you see the output here, every 100th time step uh, computes. You see the temperature goes, up, the, this is the temperature here. Uh, temperature goes up, up to the point where ignition occurred. And then the code just computes up to the point where nothing changes anymore, and then it stops. Um, so, what this does is it computes and then it says um, there's some way of how you define ignition, let's say, it doesn't matter really, but the code says at some point the temperature has increased by that much, now ignition must have occurred. This is what, what means ignition occurred, okay? This is not the ignition delay time. And then, but then the code uh, computes further until now it knows the igni ignition has, uh, has occurred computes further until nothing changes anymore, then it stops, okay? No, hold on. And then, and then the whole solution is somewhere stored in the code, and then the code looks at where, what's the, the actual ignition delay time. And that could be, for example, the maximum of CH mass fraction, which sometimes is used uh, in experiments. Uh, it could be the maximum temperature gradient or the uh, temperature rate of change. It could be OH, whatever. I mean, then um, there are ways in the code for how to change that uh, criterion. Typically, we try to use the exact same what, what people also use uh, in, um, in experiments. Okay? And then what I would do now is I look at um, output, was where we stored the output. And you see here, this now reports ignition delay times for the CH maximum, the maximum uh, CH gradient, um, OH, um, different OH criteria, and so on. Um, so this year's, this year's one. So I can say now plot this. So I use this, um, I use this tool, uh, Kaleidograph, here. And so I can plot. Um, you see the output file has 1,000 divided by temperature also. And then I get, I get a plot like this, okay? So this has all these different, and, uh, and now I can, you know, add experiments to this, and then I have a nice uh, plot that I can put in the paper. So we could now look at, um, no, maybe we don't do this, but, but now we could actually compare directly what the difference is, because you have all these di different definitions of ignition delay time, and you could directly compare. So... Sorry, I just got a text message. I have to check this. Um, oh, it's not good. Doesn't look good. <laughs> a friend of mine, he doesn't know I'm here teaching this course, so he wants to chat a little bit. Um, okay. Uh, okay. So this will this will we work. This one example, um, and then. Uh, and then also we can, we can do sensitivity analysis. So the, if I just, in the input file, I add this line, sensitivity analysis is true, 
then it will do a sensitivity analysis and you see a report here, the ignition, the, the sensitivity coefficient of ignition delay time with respect to different reactions. This is sorted here by magnitude. And you see, what a surprise, the most important reaction here for the ignition delay time of hydrogen is the reaction O2 plus H. Are you surprised? Who is surprised? No one is surprised. Very good. The second most important reaction is H plus O2 plus M. Who is surprised? No one is surprised. Okay? Anyone surprised? No. So, um, and so on. So that's, um, that's uh, a sensitivity analysis. Now, then, uh, the, I, if I add to the input file the line reaction flux analysis is true, then I get reaction flux analysis. So this here shows OH. Um, what is the main uh, reaction for OH? You see this minus is a consumption reaction, is this. This is uh, production of OH, is this and so on. So these reactions here, you see they're very unimportant. It's the same for hydrogen, same for O. So it's very easy to uh, do this reaction flux analysis and so on. Um, what is this? Well, then this is perfectly stirred reactor. Uh, this is um, uh, um, unstretched premixed flames for burning velocities. So here also there's a continuation. Uh, you can just specify uh, 10 different equivalence ratios and then they are all computed one after the other. So you get an output file for each one. Then this list tool, um, uh, tool uh, it, it can be used to just grab the value of the, of, the, uh, of the burning velocity from these individual files. And then one can make a plot like this. Um, what is this here? Counterflow diffusion flame. This is a counterflow diffusion flame. This is the one nozzle, this is the other nozzle. You see here, actually, this nozzle has a premixed mixture. Premix fuel air mixture, which is why there's an additional heat release here. Um, and here also one can do the different types of continuation always uh, with this. One of the issues is that if you want to find a steady state solution for 1D configuration, uh, th this is actually very hard. Unsteady, con unsteady simulations are much easier. This is so nonlinear that um, you have to have a nonlinear solver. Nonlinear solver would be a Newton solver. So we use a Newton solver in this code. But if, for a Newton solver to converge, you need to be quite close to the, to the solution already. You cannot start from nothing. You have to have something that's very close. So here, typically, what we do is we specify an, an, an initial solu a start solution. We call this a start solution. We call this a start profiles file. So this here would be uh, the solution for a strain rate here, A equal to 100 at um, fuel temperature of 300, oxidizer temperature of 300, pressure of one bar, hydrogen is the fuel, okay? Now, if I want to compute a strain rate of 200, I would use this here as the start solution, okay? And then, um, and then uh, start from there. Um, flamelet equations uh, can be solved, and actually there's a tutorial on, on how to do, there's a text uh, on how to do this, um, uh, in, in great detail uh, on uh, describing the um, describing uh, the um, uh, uh, maybe it's, maybe it's this, no there's a there's a, a tutorial there's a text that's called Flamed Libraries or something uh, that describes all of this in, in much detail because pe a lot of people use this for to create Flamed Libraries. What's interesting also there's a, this has an arc length continuation method. Usually, if you start here at low dissipation rate, you increase the dissipation rate, at some point it will extinguish. It's very hard to get to this branch here, which I said is unstable, but um, with this arc length continuation method, one can actually compute around this curve here and, and get all of these solutions. Um, let me skip over this. So, so this is just a um, summary uh, here again. Okay? So... Um, that's, that's the code, uh, use it. If you implement something really cool, send it back to us and we'll, we'll um, include it uh, in the code. Uh, as I said, the code is open source, so um, the, this code has been open source when the, open, the term open source had not even been invented, okay? This, I wrote this when I was a master student, a grad student, um, early 90s. 
There was no open source at the same time, but this code was open source. It was, it was online, you can just download it. Um, recently, uh, one of my students said, wrote, said in a paper, the code is open source, and the reviewer came back and said, this is not open source. Open source is explained in, you know, there's a, now it's a terminology, okay? So according to the open source terminology, this code is not open source, okay? But if you ask me, I give you the source. <laughs> that, that's not open source, but, um, but anyways. So I wrote in the rebuttal, I wrote, this term was open source when the, co when the term was not even invented. Maybe I invented the term. <laughs> maybe not, maybe not. Maybe we didn't call it open source. Um, okay, good, so uh, if, if you want, um, if you like video games, try this out. <laughs> okay, so um, we have a... So what's the score? Who knows the score? Okay, okay. Let's stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's very funny. I, I got to have a drink here. Okay, let's get back to work. Um, here, turbulence. So this was the first half of this course, let's say. First half of this course, uh, where we talk about, um, uh, you know, the chemistry a little bit. Um, so everyone here, be, be with me again. Forget about soccer, it's boring anyways. <laughs> um, we just didn't want to win. Uh, okay, so, um, no, I got distracted. What did I want to say? So, first half of the course. So, this is a new lecture now for the, um, for the video. Uh, so, we talked about uh, chemistry a little bit, and we talked about um, uh, thermodynamics, and we talked about Laminar flames. Now we want to talk about turbulent combustion. Turbulent combustion is, um, is, is a lot more complicated, is complex, and in order to uh, discuss this, we first need to say a few words about turbulence itself. Turbulence, how we typically look at turbulence, how we treat turbulence statistically, and, um, uh, and also how we model turbulent flows. So, um, combustion, and, and that's a very important uh, fact. Combustion happens only when uh, fuel and air are mixed on a molecular level, okay? Um, when we look at turbulence, turbulent mixing, really what it is, is uh, this. Here, you have fuel here, and you have oxidizer here. And then, I mean, in a laminar case, now you have diffusion, and as soon as two molecules a gray and white molecule meet, they burn, okay? Turbulence does this. Turbulence just has these eddies. Turbulence doesn't have eddies, but, we, but it's very nice to think of turbulence as all these eddies because it makes it very easy to understand certain things. Maybe it's not, it's not all too wrong. Um, instead of eddy, you could also say, we look at turbulent structures which, has a tu which have a certain velocity scale and length scale. Okay, it doesn't have to be an eddy, it doesn't have to be a round. But, but uh, that's how we look at, look at this as an eddy, it has a certain velocity scale with which it spins, and it has a, a certain length scale. So you have large eddies, small eddies, even smaller eddies, uh, some are fast, some are slow, and so on, okay? So what this does is it actually just mixes, it just it takes some fuel from here and moves it over there, and it takes some from here and moves it over there. This is an, it, advective process, okay? In the absence of diffusion, turbulence will just, you know, take this and make it look something like this. You have not mixed, just with this, with these turbulent eddies, you have not mixed fuel and air on a molecular level. This will still not burn, okay? There are a few molecules here which are next to each other, they will react very quickly and that's it, okay? But what turbulence does, it creates more, let's say, surface between these two, and it makes, most of all, it makes the gradients large, the local gradients large, because of the local, you know, straining and all of this. So it makes the local gradients large, and local gradients, large gradients, lead to fast 
uh, diffusive mixing, okay? So that's how we should look at turbulence. It's really two steps. One is the advective process, which just brings some uh, fuel from here to there. It creates these patches, but then these patches, they have large gradient, local gradients, and they have large, um, large uh, surface area, maybe between these two different regions, which leads then to fast mixing, okay? But only the mixing, the mixing, the diffusive mixing, will lead to something that can burn, okay? Just the advective part of this uh, will not burn. Okay, so characteristics of um, a turbulence uh, are that um, turbulence has vorticity. It's, it's a, you know, you, you have this, this thing we call uh, um, an eddy, which has vorticity, uh, but it's also a random process. Um, random process means, you know, things... Um, uh, you, can, you can't predict uh, the velocity of the turbulent flow. If I have a turbulent flow, I um, can measure the velocity here at some point, and it just randomly fluctu fluctuates. And maybe it's, um, it's around a certain mean value, okay, but, but uh, it fluctuates. And maybe I can say something about the mean value. I know roughly the mean value will be, you know, uh, 30 centimeter per second or whatever if I, if I turn this on, but I cannot say predict locally what, um, uh, at a certain given time, what the, the um, uh, velocity will be, okay? So it's a random process and it cannot be predicted. Uh, this is the experiment here that, um, right here, this is Professor uh, Osborne Reynolds. Um, he had this thing here, he had a pipe uh, and he had the water flowing through this pipe and then he put in a die here at one, on one side he can change the diameter of the pipe, the velocity, and also the fluid maybe here by, by changing uh, the, the viscosity by changing the fluid. And he saw that um, at some point the die, so the die actually goes here as a straight line, and at some point the die just, it breaks up and it, it you know, it mixes out very fast. This is the transition to turbulence, and he saw that <coughs> this parameter here is, which we call the Reynolds number, uh, describes this. Uh, so it's um, random, it's always three-dimensional. A turbulent flow is always three-dimensional. It cannot be described in two dimensions. And, and maybe we'll see later on why that is, has vorticity, and it happens at large Reynolds number. Large Reynolds number means the advective, so if I look at the definition of the Reynolds number, this here characterizes UD, that characterizes the advective process. Uh, basically, it comes from the a convection term in the momentum equations, and the new here, that comes from the uh, viscous term, and of course, this is the viscosity. The viscosity try to take out um, interesting stuff, okay? And the advection term, it tries to make something interesting. Um, why, why, how do you know, if you just look at the equation, the momentum equation, how do you know the convection term will do something interesting? To do something funny, and, um, oh, but, but he's also bad. This is not bad in a sense, but, um, but, but then it is here the police and always tries to make things boring. So, <laughs> so, so that's how we uh, you know, have to understand this process. So this is a measurement here, let's say, of the velocity at some point, and you see it's fluctuating. Um, because we cannot uh, predict the velocities, we want to say something about statistics. Statistics means we have a distribution function maybe, or we have a mean, we say, a, you know, a time average, for example, or we say we have a, um, a, a we look at fluctuations, a root mean square, or a um, standard deviation, things like this. So first thing we need to do is we need to define the um, uh, average. Now there's a time average I just mentioned, the time average um, is, is useful only for systems that are statistically stationary. For all other systems, the ensemble average is the better way uh, to define the average. Um, actually, it's always uh, the best way to define the average, which means I, I just do many individual measurements and then I take the average. For a time-dependent process then, I would say I repeat the experiment here I repeat it uh, 2,500 times, and I always do the experiment at 10 seconds after the start of the ex experiment, 
and I measure the velocity and then I can get the ensemble average at that point. With a time average, uh, you cannot. I mean, you, you cannot do a time average for a process that's not statistically stationary, okay? So, so that's just a simple definition. Then we say, okay, this is the average, and then we have the local instantaneous measurement minus the, the mean. That gives me the departure from the mean, or we call this the fluctuation, okay? So, so, that, so this here is the, the ensemble average, and always at each point here, at each time, the, the departure of the local instantaneous signal from the, um, uh, from the, from the mean, that's the, velocity, that's the fluctuation, okay? And we denote this here y prime. Uh, interesting now, or important, is that the mean is, um, that's deterministic, that's something we can predict. The fluctuation is always random. Okay, so by definition then, uh, the mean of the fluctuation is zero, uh, let's say here for pressure and for velocity, um, but if I take the square of a fluctuation, the square of a fluctuation, and take the mean of that, that is not zero, okay? Because if I have a, a local signal, which looks like this, okay, then um, this is the mean. So if I just take the departures from the mean and I average them, they give me zero. This average gives me zero. But if I square the signal, then it looks like this. Then everything is positive if I take the mean of this. It basically gives me a measure for the departure from the mean, okay? We call this then the root mean square. Because, uh, it should be called square mean root, but it's called the root mean square. And, um, or, you know, this, this square, we call this sometimes the, the, um, uh, the this, this square without the square, we call it the variance sometimes. And uh, the standard deviation is also related to this. Now, what's interesting is that uh, in... In um, reactive flows, we always have, uh, we often have, um, uh, or we always have density changes. So, so if I want to take an average of a um, quantity rho u or rho y, uh, which which is a term that which is um, a combination that always appears in the equations. So if I take the average of this, then that will be equal to rho mean plus rho prime times u mean plus u prime, and then from this I get rho mean, u mean plus, um, and then here I have uh, rho prime, u prime, rho prime, u prime, plus two other terms, this will be zero, but then uh, you see we, if I take the average of this, I get a term here, this is not zero, just like a square. If these are correlated, then this is like, this, like the square I showed you there, okay? So because of this in combustion always, we introduce a different kind of averaging. We call it, a, a, we, um, we introduce a density weighted average, which we call the Favre averaging. So we define a Favre average, which we denote by tilde, and the Favre fluctuation by uh, prime prime. And the way we define it, we really define it so that this term here is zero, okay? So if we assume, if we then say this term here should be zero, so if I take this, then, um, uh, you know, this is exactly what I just did. Uh, you get this second term here, and then uh, we just say this second term should be zero. And then you see u tilde has to be defined as rho u bar divided by rho bar. Then, then this is zero, okay? So that's the definition. Um, and now, if we take the average of this, then we get only uh, one, then we get only one single term here, because this is already uh, the tilde term. So that's, that's just a trick to get less terms. Um, if I know, uh, you know, all these signals, I can convert the Favre average into the normal Reynolds average, but I need to know these correlations then. Very often we just, so, so turns out that also some experimental techniques, they really give you a, a density weighted average rather than uh, a, a not weighted average. Uh, so this would actually be the right way to compare this. Uh, very often also, we compare the density weighted average, Favre average, uh, with a non-density weighted average, um, and it turns out they're very similar. This is not big departure, but one has to keep this in mind. Okay, so that's Favre average for the, 
for most of, of what I'm telling you here about turbulence, we don't use the Faber average because all of, all of this is just for uh, incompressible flows, so there's no uh, variation. So there are different um, special cases for turbulent flows, and one of these special cases here is what's called homogeneous turbulence. These special cases, they are defined because then, again, the analysis uh, is simpler. Uh, if one defines a case that's simple enough, then I can analyze it mathematically and, and learn something from it. So the um, uh, homogeneous turbulence means that statistics of the turbulent flow, here for example the mean, the fluctuations and all of this, statistics of the turbulent flow, they should be, um, they should be um, invariant under translation in space or they should be independent of the position in the flow. Okay, so, so homogeneous turbulence means if I have certain statistics here and I measure certain statistics there, they should be the same, okay? So that can be expressed like this. These statistics at, at x, they should be exactly the same as statistics evaluated at x plus delta x, okay? Uh, so that means homogeneous and then um, the, the, a, a, f a further restriction is what's called isotropic turbulence. Isotropic turbulence, that's the simplest form of turbulence where we say um, the all statistics, they're invariant under translation, so they are the same everywhere in the flow, and they're also invariant under rotation of the coordinate system. So if I measure a velocity uh, u and v, let's say, okay? So let's say I measure velocity statistics of u, then uh, it's invariant under translation of the coordinate system, which means uh, it has to be the same as the statistics of v. In every direction in which I measure, the, the velocity component um, has the same statistics. So um, that's what isotropic turbulence says. This also means, I mean, uh, uh, it means that the mean velocity has to be zero because I cannot have a velocity that at the same time mean velocity that goes left and right, okay? So the only way to always measure the same um, velocity component in each direction is if the mean velocity is zero, okay? For the fluctuations, um, this is not the case, but um, so the fluctuations, they are, they are non-zero. Here also this correlation uh, has to be zero. So, so um, isotropic turbulence, that sounds like a very strong restriction, and it is, but it is uh, very important for several reasons. First of all, uh, the equations become very simple, and it's, it allows us to understand something about turbulence. And secondly, um, uh, we'll see later on that there is this so-called Kolmogorov hypothesis um, of local isotropy, which uh, actually says, if I look at a flow at small enough scales, if I, you see here you have these, this large structure here and you have small structure. If I look at small enough structures, then the flow will be isotropic. At small scales, the flow will be isotropic. So that's why, why this is very important. This just shows you a few examples here of, of direct numerical simulations uh, we have done for turbulent flows. Uh, this here is... Um, uh, this here is a shear layer, here you have float going to the left, here to the right, and in the, in the direction into the board, the flow is actually homogeneous. Uh, this here is um, uh, also uh, just a mixing layer. Here you have maybe fuel, here you have uh, oxygen or air, and this shows you mixing between these. And this here is um, uh, a jet. Uh, actually, it's a, uh, I don't think this is a round jet. I think this is a, a, a planar jet. This here is, um, uh, iso this is homogeneous uh, turbulence, and it just shows you here, this was done on 2,000 times 2,000 times 2,000 uh, cells, which would be 8 billion, 8 billion computation cells. So that's large, it's not, we have done larger simulations, that's just uh, an example, and if you zoom, you see a lot of structures here, here you see, you see this is a little more red, this is a little more yellow, so I would say this is one large turbulent structure, this is one large turbulent structure. This here is again a region which is more yellow. And if I zoom into this, you can do the same thing. At the smaller scale, again I see something that's more, yellow, more red, uh, more yellow and so on. And if I zoom into this, I, again I find regions which are more yellow and more red. So, so this shows you the multi-scale nature 
of a turbulent flow. And, and here, if you go to the smaller scales, then here you can't see a directional dependence anymore. Uh, this is another simulation here. The size uh, is not shown here. This is a shear flow again here. Flow goes to the left, here goes to the right. This is from the top and um, again, you see, you see uh, uh, some structures. Okay, I think the next thing we want to do is to um, uh, derive the mean flow equations. For that, um, we start out, and maybe we'll just uh, uh, do the continuity equation. We start with the governing equations. Here I told you, I give you the example only for incompressible flows. Incompressible flow gives you a continuity equation which says the divergence of velocity is zero, or, or uh, dui dxj is zero, or you could say del dot u is zero, and then the, this is the um, uh, momentum equation, okay? So you see this j here is, a, is an index uh, one, two, three, so these are three equations actually. This here is a divergence, so this here is a scalar, and so you see are uh, four equations. Why four equations? Because we have four unknowns, uh, three velocity components, and the pressure. So with this then, I have four equations with four unknowns, which um, is not trivial to solve this. There's actually a trick uh, to, to do this, but, but that can be solved. Now, if I introduce the Reynolds decomposition into these uh, equations, because I want to derive equations here for the mean, I can start out here with, um, uh, with the continuity equation, and that would then look like this. So I have the continuity equation, which is duj divided by, uh, by dxj is equal to zero. So I introduce the, um, uh, the, the Reynolds decomposition, then I get duj bar plus, D, plus uj prime by dxj um, is equal to zero. So now you see I can split these up. Uh, from this then I get duj by d um, xj plus d uj prime by d xj, okay? And that's equal to zero. So then, um, so that is still a local instantaneous equation. I haven't done any averaging yet, okay? All I did was I, I just introduced the definition for uh, the mean, okay? So this has now all the fluctuations. Now the next step what I do is I I do the average of this, okay? So if I do this, then I get um, the average of A plus B is the same as the average of A plus the average of B. The, remember the uh, definition of the ensemble average is just the sum anyways of different realizations. Uh, you can see these um, uh, things very easily. So this would be UJ bar bar divided by XJ plus, sorry, actually I should write it like this, and then plus d u j prime bar divided by x j equals zero, okay? And now um, the averaging operator, beca again, because it's just a sum of different realization, it commutes, the, this operator commutes with a partial derivative. So I can write this as uh, d u j bar bar by d x j plus d u j prime bar by d x j equals zero, okay? And now, um, if you apply an averaging operator to something that is an average already, uh, it, it's the same, so this goes away. And the, uh, this, by definition, the average of a fluctuating quantity is zero. So this will be zero, okay? So this is the equation as it's shown there. Why does it come out to be exactly the same for the mean as for the, uh, as for the local instantaneous? It's the same equation as what we started out with because there's a linear equation. The nonlinearities come in if I have a product of two different uh, variables like here. So linear equation uh, is the same. I can now subtract this equation from this one here, let's say, and you see then the first part goes away and you get this. So this also holds for the fluctuation, for the fluctuating velocity. Okay, no surprise because it's a linear equation. Now for the momentum equation, we have a nonlinear term. And the nonlinear term will lead to an extra term 
And that extra term then uh, here, that's the so-called Reynolds stress tensor. That is what makes all the difference between uh, uh, turbulent and non-turbulent flow. And I think we'll uh, stop here and, and discuss this tomorrow. So um, uh, have a good, good afternoon. Don't cry too much. I'll go back to my uh, uh, hotel crying for the rest of the afternoon. But hopefully tomorrow <laughs> I will be back. Yeah.